Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. That's right. We are very quickly, Danielle. We're going to be together mm -hmm. again. We are approaching yeah. our big show finale at CrimeCon Orlando. And guess what? We want you there. We do. As sad as it makes me, I can't stand even hearing that, but we want you guys to meet up with us for the big finale. How do you get your name on the guest list and a bunch of free Crime After Crime swag? I know you're all asking yourself. So all you have to do is visit CrimeCon.com and buy a standard CrimeCon pass today using the code Crime After Crime with no spaces. And then make sure, first of all, you use the code. Don't forget that part. And then email your receipt to crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com. That is crimeaftercrime at L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S dot com. The sooner the better because we do have a limited number of seats and swag. And we don't want you guys to miss out. That's right. So let's get right to today's episode. We're going to start with the results from our last episode, Australian Crimes. Danielle told the Ooh. story of a tiger shark who didn't actually eat tigers at all. He nope. puked up a man's arm, which led to a crazy crime story. Typical yeah. Australian things. <laughs> I guess so. And uh, I told <laughs> the story about a member of Star Force who, despite being shot numerous times, survived and didn't need to be rebuilt into a cybernetic RoboCop to get back to work. How did it all play out, Danielle? All right, you guys. So on Twitter... I received 61% of the votes Ooh. and John received 39%. Oh, so close. But before you get ahead of yourself, something fun happened. I actually really look forward to when this happens. On no. the website poll, I only received 44% of the votes and John received 56%. My brain so just twisted. Happens, yeah, what see, happens? Exactly. <laughs> we always have to tally it up to individual votes for you know new percentages. Figure it all out. I don't do the math. John usually does that. <laughs> and I didn't win. I only had 46% and John took the mug with 54% of the that's overall vote. Right. 54%. But Danielle, that's a close 46, 54. It is a close one. That's a but close But your one. story, there was just this, uh, my story was crazy, but your story just had this element to it of just like what a good guy like i left and was like thinking about it for so long afterwards i was like i wish all police forces were like the star force yeah <laughs> even though yeah. they had to change their name yeah but it was just great i loved that i loved the sweet story behind it all it was something so tragic but to see someone pull through like that well i love that i figured out that that formula because all i had to do was find a story yeah. where it would make me cry while i was telling it I swear, I, I, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've I've gotten emotional recording. Like, it doesn't happen a whole lot. But man, his buddies going yeah. and fixing up his house while he's recovering it was sweet. from 14 gunshot wounds. I mean, it was amazing. It's an amazing story. I know. Uh, and I, the fact that he even survived, I was absolutely shocked. Yeah. And I cry on a regular basis in all of my videos, so I can't relate to that. Well, now I need to, yeah, now I need to work it in. I got to figure out where I can cry in today's story. We'll see. We'll see I if know. I can do that. Uh, but before we get to our stories, we want to learn a little more about evidence. So mm -hmm. I tried to answer a question. How many different types of evidence are there? That's kind of easy because there's like four. Right. So there's real evidence, which is often called physical evidence. That's stuff that you can hold and inspect. And then there's demonstrative evidence. So that's maps, charts, a diagram of the crime scene. There's documentary evidence. So letters, contracts, pictures, recordings. And then finally, testimonial evidence, which is obviously getting someone on the stand under oath. That's what I thought, too. Uh, and several search results do point out those four. But some places mm -hmm. actually dig a little deeper, and I'm seeing lists that say you can have more than 20 different types of evidence. Now, oh, wow. that being said, I think they all kind of fall into those four major categories. But yeah, I can see that. Some of the types that don't always spring right to mind are prima facie evidence, sometimes mm. called presumptive evidence. So it's where you use other types of evidence gathered from a crime scene to make a plausible assumption. For example, yeah, everyone watching or listening, uh, for me, 
to be able to correctly pronounce prima facie means that the listeners may assume I ran a pronunciation check on Google and wrote it down phonetically in this script because they would know that I can't pronounce anything above an eighth grade reading level. But it means on its face, which is where I usually wind up with tough pronunciations like prima facie. Look, I'm impressed though. I feel like me and you both struggle with that, except you will take the time to look it up and I just totally destroy well you know what <laughs> gets me is blind and... you know what gets me is when you look it up and the result you get is wrong it doesn't help you <laughs> no no, it no, no. Doesn't it, help you like, it's just wait. wrong <laughs> it's just wrong like there's so many times google and it's the google result you know they have like a special oh, no. section where mm -hmm. i know whenever i see the face come up with the mouth that moves when you hit the button for the pronunciation yep. um i can only Don't trust those on <laughs> yeah i can i can trust them like 70 percent of the time basically yeah yeah well Impression evidence, speaking of evidence, is something like tire tread tracks, footstep tracks, even holes or cracks in walls from objects striking them. Mm -hmm. Character evidence, mm -hmm. bring up a witness to help show the jury what a jerk that defendant is. Exactly. Have to have that. And then there's habit evidence. I couldn't have broken into the bank that night because my choir group meets up on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. every single week. Choir group, Danielle. It may or may not just be me singing to my chickens and it all, also maybe every day of the week <laughs> instead of only just Wednesday, every single day, all times of the day. Why do it's I not believe a set that? schedule? It's just the feeling, you know, it's just when you know. I totally believe it. You, we need to get Absolutely, a mic. You should. <laughs> we need a mic in there when you're singing to the chickens. Uh, there's trace evidence, which is not only a great podcast, but yeah. tiny pieces of physical matter that might transfer during a crime. Gunshot residue, hair, and even pollen are some examples. Exculpatory evidence, which is one of my personal favorites. Absolutely love it. It's always interesting to see, which is basically if you're the one facing the charges, this is what you want to be seeing. It's evidence that might exonerate the defendant. Mm. Well, sounds like they forgot to put one on that list, and that is craziest evidence. Let's hear our first craziest evidence story told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. Love the intro. Mm -hmm. While I now, sit using my winner's <laughs> mug over here. Whatever, Todd. I know, and you keep, I'm, I'm nervous. You keep rubbing your story in my face, and I'm like, is my story going to be good enough? Because this topic was actually like way harder than I assumed it would be. I feel like we keep running into this problem where we're recovering these same topics. Yeah. And I'm like, how did we find what we found like years ago? Um, I feel like a big thing this time was actually, though, that everything right now is about solving cases through genealogy. And mm -hmm. so that was like all the searches, everything was coming up like that. So stories of bizarre evidence, cracking cases, I feel like have just disappeared down the Google black hole, unfortunately. So I fell back on a common search that typically always delivers. And it led me to the Hamburglar himself. Okay. The Hamburglar, like the McDonald's the Hamburglar. Ha the Hamburglar, yes. Okay, all right. So in late 2013, 34-year-old Dominic Johnson from Chicago, Illinois, came up with an absolutely brilliant plan after becoming bored with his current job. To make ends meet, he had been working as a caretaker for an elderly man named Mr. Morgan. And while this was putting cash in his pocket, you know, he's like, ah, I want a little more. I've got bigger dreams. So he had been racking his brain. How could I make more money? And a light bulb ended up going off during one of his weekly tasks with Mr. Morgan. They frequently went to a PNC bank location in Galesburg, Michigan. And at one of their trips, he's like, you know what? This would be an incredibly easy place to rob. What? Because <laughs> you know, we all just have those thoughts when we're hanging out at a bank. <laughs> Seriously. He had been there so many times at this point as a caretaker that he was very well aware of how many employees typically worked there, what their temperament was like, you know, the layout of the bank, all the escape routes. And he fully believed that he could easily get away with a good bit of cash. And so he reached out to his 21-year-old half-brother, Nathan Benson, in hopes that he would help in getting the job done. And without hesitation, Benson's like, absolutely, sign me up. And so the plan started to form by February of 2014. The brothers ended up meeting at Johnson's home. He was kind of like the mastermind in Chicago. 
And they decided that Nathan Vincent, the younger brother, would actually be the one to go in and physically rob the bank. Because while Johnson did have all the knowledge, everyone there knew him. So he would be way too recognizable at this point. And so the plan, the rough plan at least, was that Benson would go in alone, rob the bank, while Johnson waited at a nearby church parking lot as the getaway driver. So over the next few months, the brothers continued planning the details, hoping that it would all work out seamlessly. And Benson took a few extra steps for his role. He purchased a revolver, um, ammunition, uh, all from a local drug dealer. And by May 29th, 2014, the heist began. Benson made his way to a rental car lot in Chicago because they didn't want the vehicle that they used in the robbery to tie back to them as easy. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm already like, uh uh-oh, rental car. Like, you don't want records on this stuff. But, yeah, okay. Not not the sharpest crayons. Well, it's weird because the thought about like I can't be the person to rob the bank because I go in there all the time. Like I was, yeah. I was kind of impressed by that. I'm like, hey, not bad. Like he's going to collect the oh, intel, man. pass it to someone else, and then have them go and pull it off. Like that seems kind of intelligent. So to hear that they're like, I'm going to go rent a car for this robbery. It ping pongs back and forth. You're just okay. you're going to be dizzy by the end of the story. <laughs> All right. So once he had this car secured, he picked up his brother and the two of them headed out of Illinois into Michigan. Once they arrived at the PNC Bank in Kalamazoo, Benson headed in without hesitation and held up the entire place at gunpoint before running off with $40,000. Wow. That's a good haul. Wow. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So obviously they're absolutely thrilled. But again, apparently not at all concerned that they would get caught because Mm. they immediately went to the mall. (laughs) What? (laughs) They went to the mall? They did. They immediately went to the mall for a shopping spree, (laughs) which, you know, this was the point. You know, you picked it up already with, you know, the rental car. And I did, but I was like trying to think. I'm like, okay, maybe they've got some plan. This should have been like my red flag of like. "Mm." (laughs) Not the genius criminals. This is just. This is not great. So after they had their bit of fun, they needed to finish cleaning up after themselves. Okay. You know, priorities. First shopping, then clean up after the crime. So at this point, they decided to switch things up and hopefully make their movements confusing. And so Benson ended up going back to Chicago by train and he had been the one to pick up the car. So they're like, oh, we're going to throw him off. And then his brother Johnson took the car back the next day after the heist. And so they're like, no one's going to know we were together. Like, they've got two different descriptions of who was with the car. Some things they're thinking about, other things not so much. It's weird. Yeah. that's I'm confused. Like, is one of them mm -hmm. smart and the other one not so smart? And they're meshing their plan together? Like, it's it's weird. I think that's a high possibility. Yeah. Yeah. That's really So within a few weeks, no authorities were on their trail. And so they're like okay, we're confident enough and we're hooked enough on this easy money. And so heist number two went into the planning stages. On July 29th, 2014, Benson rented yet another car in Chicago before heading into Michigan after picking up his brother. So the same plan again. The only difference this time, for the most part, was that they were hitting a different bank. They were going to go to the Comerica Bank in Comstock. Okay. Benson did, however, decide to go and pick up a new gun. Now, honestly, not like I'm suggesting this, but he went to a store and bought it this time, which probably is a lot more traceable than a drug dealer. Yeah. yeah. Um, But seeing as the roles worked perfect the first time, they did the same thing again. Benson stormed into the bank while Johnson waited in a nearby parking lot. And just like the first time, everything went according to plan. And honestly, even better because they made off with $80,000 this time. Double what they got away with the first time. And so at this point, they're like absolutely beside themselves. They're like, we've pulled so much off you know we're gonna lay low for a few weeks to see if yet again we will get away with what we've done oh wait they didn't go right to the mall it would have been like hey this time no (laughs) wow all right so they even figured that out lay low Mm -hmm. let let it cool down a bit (laughs) yeah they were like we're just gonna keep to ourselves and you know a few weeks passed no one seemed to be on their trail or having any idea it was them and so they did what most criminals do Got way too overconfident. Yeah. And they're like, we're going to push things further. 
So just months later, in October of 2014, the third plan was in motion. And this time, they thought they were going to go big. Johnson and Benson purchased multiple firearms. And at this point, they both planned to be involved in the robbery. They bought all black clothing and masks and all sorts of things to hide their identity. And instead of relying on a rental car, because (laughs) I think they kind of figured out that's probably not the smartest thing. Instead, they were going to drive all the way to Indiana to steal a license plate Mm. to Mm. use in the crime. You know, I mean, a stolen license plate, it's a little better, I think, than a rental car. I mean, at least the paperwork isn't going to tie right back to you, but okay. But their lucky streak hit a wall. They ended up being involved in a traffic violation (laughs) while in Indiana. And I don't know, I couldn't find exactly what led to a search of the car, but a search of the car occurred. And the officer finds two loaded semi-automatic pistols. No. And like black clothing, black gloves, black trash masks. bags, black ski masks, <laughs> like the whole shebang, like a straight up robbery starter kit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, and you know what's so crazy to me? And I feel like it's probably because you can't just look at those things and say, hey, something's going on. Like, you know what I mean? You can't. Yeah. Yeah. Common sense tells you something's going on, but the only thing they could really do was charge them with unlawful carrying of a concealed weapon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you've got nothing to tie it to, I mean, what can you say? Like, I mean, maybe it was a Halloween costume and I know. they happen to have <laughs> yeah, <totally>. real weapons. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> I know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Halloween with real semi-automatic guns. Yeah. Um. So while this does seem like a bit of a setback to Johnson and Benson, they're like, we actually did get lucky. You know, they were in another state. So I'm sure nothing at all also pointed to the robberies in Michigan, tied them to anything. And so they're like, we're going to ignore this. Everything will be fine. We're going to keep pushing forward. And so after giving things a bit of time to calm down on January 8th, 2015, they're like, okay, we're going to try again. But instead of trying to like be crazy about this and make a long risky drive to an outside state, we're just going to follow what we did before. They just went back to the original thought. Um, But they weren't settled on renting another car still. So it really does seem like they were trying to learn from their mistakes. And so instead they borrowed a friend's car because nothing shows a friend that you care like using their car in a crime. (laughs) <laughs> that's the way that i tell my friends that i love them the tracking <laughs> like, on that's what? just as bad it's just as bad as the rental situation because you now you're not going to piss off that friend if the cops go right to them and they are absolutely right. going to tell on you <laughs> i mean i don't i don't know but once the car was secured okay off they went to michigan where benson stormed the old nationals bank in kalamazoo But this heist would be their downfall in a very unexpected way. This time they were disappointed because they only left the bank with $8,000 in cash. Now, that's what I was expecting for all of these hits, because typically you're only getting what's in the registers. Like they're not going to go open, Mm -hmm. you know, the big. But it sounds like they were either either getting back to the safe or they were hitting banks that had a lot of registers. It had to be one or the other. Exactly. And from the photos I've seen, it it really doesn't look like big banks. And so I feel like they had to be getting them back to the safe. Yeah. Um, But, you know, I mean, compared to the $80,000 they were getting, they probably were like, oh, great. This is chump change. But they had larger problems on their hands. Many banks in this area of Michigan had been very well aware at this point that there were robberies going on and they had stepped up their game, hoping that they wouldn't fall victim as easily. On top of that, Johnson and Benson did not know that the FBI and local authorities had been working together to try and figure out who was behind all of the heists because it was very obvious it was likely the same group committing them all. So while Benson had, in fact, been handed $8,000, the teller had also slipped in a die pack. Mm. And so within moments of fleeing the building, the pack exploded absolutely everywhere. Red dye all over the place. And so all the money, useless. So not only did they manage to get less money, but they had no other option but to just toss it and flee empty handed. So this was already a huge dent in their plan. They've already had so many things go wrong between emotions running high. And I think at this time they were picking up that someone was 
you know, attempting to stop these robberies. Mm -hmm. They sped off worried, you know, authorities are going to be hot on our trail. But they had another issue. They decided to rob this bank in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> and okay. road conditions are awful. And that really does not go hand in hand with fast and furious driving techniques. Yeah, no high speed chase in the snowstorm. No. Yeah. So as they're fleeing for their lives across the street, like literally across the street, they slide on snow and ice and end up in a ditch. Mm. Sheer panic. Authorities were likely en route to the bank at this point. They were way too close and way too stuck for comfort. So both Johnson and Benson jumped from the car and frantically tried to push it back onto the road to continue their getaway. And after barely getting the car out of the ditch, they went all the way back to Chicago empty-handed. But they had been so panicked and focused on fleeing that they didn't even notice that they left a bit of evidence behind. Mm. Now, you would think at this point, there's got they've got to be second guessing what they're doing right yeah yeah no absolutely not mm -mm. <laughs> like i said you would think yeah <laughs> well they it's weird because you know yeah they they were figuring out a method they did better on the second mm -hmm. but then a couple of big stumbles and like did the thought exactly. not occur to them of maybe we got lucky twice and it's exactly. not this easy <laughs> don't worry it just it just it just keeps <laughs> so just a month after they after this they attempted another robbery they're like we've got to make up for this money that we lost and so for some reason yet again they're like you know the perfect time to commit a robbery a snowstorm <laughs> Terrible. they don't even make it to the location because they got in a car accident on the way <laughs> <laughs> well that might have saved them i'm telling they, you the robbery didn't happen they thought they were slick, but those roads, mm -hmm. those roads were slicker. Yep. So at this point, you're like, please, please stop. <laughs> I please feel arrest like anyone, these guys. Like even, yeah, like we're, not, and like you said, we're not talking about small fails at this point. We're talking about being pulled over, die packs, getting stuck in ditches, car accidents, like one thing after another. And I feel like even the most thick person would be like, mm, what am I doing? And Benson, the younger brother was like, something we shouldn't do this anymore so he actually comes to his senses and backs out but johnson was determined okay Be and you know he's like i gotta keep this going because i lost money i know i can make this work and since the sidekick abandoned him he had to find more so he made a very risky decision to bring on not just one person but four brand new accomplices no wow and we find out who wasn't paying attention to the details because one of the people that he, he entrusted with this information immediately went to the FBI. Mm -hmm. So the FBI was notified that Johnson's, you know, shenanigans, what he was doing, and surveillance immediately began on him. But they had to prove at this point, you know, we have to know for a fact this is true. Like what this person is saying, the information they're giving us, everything adds up. And while they did have surveillance from all of these banks, keep in mind, Johnson was not the one going in. It was Benson. Right. And so they really had nothing at all that was tying Johnson to the crimes. And they didn't even know who Benson was yet. They hadn't even identified him. And so they started to look into all of these robberies deeper. And while no physical evidence had been found, obviously, in most of the robberies, there's not going to be you know, you wouldn't expect a lot of physical evidence. There had been something with potential found at one. When Johnson and Benson had gone into the ditch, that third robbery, mm -hmm. they were unknowingly being watched by a neighbor. And when the neighbor later that day heard of the attempted robbery at the bank, they kind of put two and two together and they reached out to law enforcement right away about the suspicious activity. And they were like, look, these guys have been right across the street from the bank. Clearly, they were in a rush. It fits the timeline given. And so when the Kalamazoo Sheriff's Office and the FBI arrived on scene, they were able to see like the marks in the snow where they had kind of gone off the road. And right beside where the car had been, either in a frantic struggle or someone's dumb idea to trot, like toss trash at the worst place and time possible, was a half-eaten Wendy's burger. <laughs> 
just like beaming in the snow. <laughs> no way. <laughs> really? Half eaten Wendy's burger. That's burger insane. was obviously immediately collected for evidence. They're like, oh, you thought, but we've got you, okay? You had to have a snack while you waited, didn't you? And so they bring it in, has DNA on it. Oh. And so sample was sent off to look for a potential match. Now, this is huge because this is the only physical evidence that they have so far. So the FBI and local authorities are like, okay, we're going to continue to gather information. Um, we need an open and shut case as we wait for these results. And this included tracking Johnson's phone. Because all the descriptions they were getting from the neighbors at this point, things seemed to be adding up. And they were able to find that his phone had been pinging off of towers in the areas around the robberies, every single one of them. And it tied him to Benson as well. Because while they had these decently thought out plans, all these disguises, sneaky cars, they used their personal cell phones the entire time. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, and they... And they also started a phone call with each other the moment Benson walked in the door, and it yeah. lasted precisely the same amount of time. Robbery. <laughs> I mean, I, I, look, I get the thought of I want an audio feed. I want to hear what's happening yeah. in there. Like that's which was their once again, process, yeah, a good thought in terms of trying to pull that off. But go pick up, stop at Seven Eleven, which is right yeah, next door to exactly. Wendy's, from what I understand, and pick up two burner oh, phones. Absolutely. Like I just, yep. I don't get it. Wow. Wow. And so at this point, they're like, we've got a ton of supporting evidence here. You know, these guys are definitely involved. And then the DNA tests come back from the half-eaten Wendy's burger. Yeah. It was Johnson. Mm. Johnson had been just a munching on that burger. <laughs> and his DNA was all over it. I wonder if it flew out and the so, window during the accident. I've wondered that. Yeah. I've wondered that. I'm wondering if they like opened the doors and like when they frantically got up, maybe if like the burger was on his lap or something, you know, he's like waiting yeah. on yeah. the phone, like, oh, how's this robbery going? Munch, munch. Like, yeah. And it was in his lap and he stood up and it like flew out. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of finding all this information, they're still, you know, trying to get a grip on everything. On February 27th, authorities finally have the perfect opportunity to bring Johnson in because they're watching his phone. They've obtained a warrant, they're tracking what this man is doing. And he's showing a familiar movement. And they're like, for real? For real? You think, like, again, you're leaving Illinois. You're going to Michigan. Oh, you're in Kalamazoo. Here wow. we go again. And so they race to track this phone because they're fearing another robbery. And, you know, obviously with a situation like that, he had been caught with weapons not too long before. They're like, what if this goes wrong? Like, we have to yeah. stop here. And so... They managed to trace his phone to an SUV sitting in a Comerica Bank parking lot. And his phone was tracking to that car for sure, but no robbery happened. And so authorities just watched the SUV and then tailed it as it left. And while authorities are trying to, you know, scramble to find a way to legally pull them over, since technically, yeah. you know, they didn't witness a robbery or anything, thankfully the SUV committed a traffic violation. Again, dude, just drive just right. <laughs> Especially if you know, like, I don't know if they went in undercover. I'm assuming it's likely that they did. But come on. Like, if yeah. you know you're doing something wrong, I feel like you at least have this inkling in the back of your brain that's like, your posture even goes straight. Like, Yeah, no <laughs> California like stops. Pay attention yeah, to the speed limit. absolutely not. Yeah, like, you mm -hmm. know, just lock it in. Just be like the best. Act like you're a driving instructor for that, exactly. that day. Exactly. Yeah. But wow. no, they like swerved, cut somebody off, and then were like riding over the fog lane, like line. Wow. So like, not again, not even something necessarily super small. Like they almost caused an accident. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And so a traffic stop obviously ensued. And Johnson and all of his accomplices were in there. And so all of these accomplices were questioned. And they all spilled the beans, like did not care. We're just like, oh, yeah, he totally hired us to rob this bank. But we didn't do it because he got cold feet. <laughs> and when they finally got to Benson, who had backed out, he also just like told them everything. Wow. And so at this point, they're like, we can officially tie him. He's a mastermind behind all these robberies through data collection, witnesses, and strangely, one of his meals. 
tied it with DNA, you know? And so the whole group was charged with bank robbery, conspiracy, along with numerous firearms charges and, and an even bigger blow. Benson testified against his own brother. Ooh, wow. To wow. get a lesser sentence. And like by a lot, Benson received 14 years in prison, which is a lot, but Johnson received 72. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> That man does not have good luck. No, no. At all. Huge thank you to the New York Post, CaseLaw.com, Fox 47 News, CBS News for this ridiculous story about the half-eaten hamburger. There's so DNA. many so many things yeah. that just take a left turn in that story. Like it really does sound I know. Like, like at first it starts off and you're like, yeah. wow, how are they pulling this off? And then it like very quickly, all pun intended, snowballs. Yeah. I mean, banks, you know, they know these processes. They know how to handle mm -hmm. situations like that. That's why they do things like make sure that everything goes back into the yep. big vault and they keep small mm -hmm. amounts of cash out front. Like they it, it's weird because it almost seems to me like a drug hit. Like they yeah. they got this first hit of like, ooh, look at all this money. And then they And it got super exciting for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they literally go shopping right off the bat, almost like that same thing. Like they're just in a high. And then, oh, we're mm -hmm. going to do it again. And then they get even more money. And from there, it's like they're sunk because it's now they're going to be chasing that high for forever. Yeah. Well, exactly. And I think like riding that, they, as soon as things started to happen, like they, they knew, I think they could sense that something was wrong. And like, that's almost what made them continuously make these like little dumb mistakes that eventually got them caught. Yeah. Because yeah. they, in the back of their mind, they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> I think there's a possibility that, you know, because I mean, good grief. I mean, at least I'm hoping. Yeah. Well, I, also, <laughs> I'm over I here, also, like, hopefully they had some common sense in there. I, I also have to say that I really respect because we, we don't hear this too often. I respect that they came clean. The guys that were busted. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. We never hear about that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for them to be like, yeah, yeah, that was us. Yeah, we did that. Like. I, like immediately. I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> sure, there's some question of, you know, like, did it help them out or not? But knowing the evidence that was stacked yeah. against them, like, there would be no benefit to them trying to lie their way out of that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, at that point, all his, you know, the people that were working with him on the more recent robbery, they probably could have only been charged with conspiracy. They hadn't done anything yeah. unless, obviously, there were probably weapons and things in the vehicle. Even but that. Yeah, that's minor stuff. I'm sure they were like, look, we do not want to be tied to the other robberies that he has committed. I'm sure they were like, mm -mm, nope. Yeah. He did it. <laughs> it was him. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Hamburger bun. It yeah. reminds me, you know, of like the tossed cigarette butt or the piece of gum. I'm like, yeah. people, come on. Like. Yeah. We hear that. I we love hear watching these little things just take bad people down. <laughs> yeah. Cigarette butt gum yeah. uh water bottle or mm -hmm. soda can like those are kind of the common dna holders or vehicles i guess oh but, yeah yeah I've, i don't I got think lucky i've heard with a burger yeah i don't think i've heard of one about the burger and it's interesting because in terms of the evidence it's kind of loose like who's to exactly. say that, the, that burger it came from that car the, what is it called face 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 feet i don't know i'm past that part of the script i can't pronounce it <laughs> you're anymore. like i can't the phonetics is gone <laughs> prima facie <laughs> Yeah, I think I was close. That. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of that type of evidence, yeah. though, like where yeah. an assumption can be made. Right. I mean, tire like, tracks look, show exactly leading to here. Right. Same time at the bank, a witness confirms that, and then here's your half-eaten burger, Mister. Yeah. Like, bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. Plus, Wendy's is very tasty, and people wouldn't yeah. just typically mm -hmm. throw their Wendy's away without finishing Absolutely it. Absolutely not. So yeah, there's there's a lot of different evidence at play there. <laughs> Clearly someone uh, was in a panic. <laughs> yeah. Well, Danielle has now made everyone hungry. And with that, yes. we have to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. All right, you guys. Welcome back. I'm preparing myself. He always does this when he has a good story. I, usually he'll just, you know, email me like, this is my topic. Just don't choose this one. But this time he got to me like a couple days earlier than usual. <laughs> And when that email pops in, I'm always like, no, like immediate panic. <laughs> well, look, like, we had a good one. I remember why I started doing this, Danielle. You might not remember mm -hmm. this. It was months ago and we had picked a topic. I can't remember what the name of the topic was, but I remember the case. Okay. I had started working on 
one, but I didn't tell oh, you the no. topic yet. And, and you I started working it. on the same one. If I yeah. remember right, it was the Charlie Chaplin story. Yeah. And I remember I got really upset when you told me that because tell me next time, be like, Danielle, no, too late. <laughs> Like I, I called dibs on this. I'm already like so but many I didn't. words in. You can't that, do this. <laughs> that was on me. That was on me because I didn't send the email to say that. So what's yeah. happened now is, you know, typically we'll research this like the week that we film. Mm -hmm. And I've started bumping it up to like a week or two before I that. Like, I want first You're grab. You're sending me into a tizzy, John. <laughs> <laughs> like fully. Well, it's interestingly, freaking me out. <laughs> I did not. I didn't even bump into that story that you told us about the Wendy's burger. I, I like didn't even come up on my it's, radar. The other thing. It's slim pickings though out there. Yeah. I didn't even bump into the stuff that we had covered before. Mm -hmm. Like I had I no idea how I got yep. to the story last time. Um, but I did keep at it. I kept looking. Okay. I found something. And uh, mm -hmm. I like to intimidate you by sending you messages weeks in advance saying that this is the best story that you've ever heard. You ready? Perfect. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. This one's actually, this one's, this one's a little different. It's a little different. Okay. It was July. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. There's a very serious aspect to it, unfortunately. Uh, it was July 24th, 1985 mm -hmm. at the Eastgate Apartments. Back. Yeah. This is this, this one. Let's see. John, young John was about 10 years old somewhere in the world when this is going on. Uh, it was at the Eastgate Apartments in Garland, a town in Dallas County, Texas. There was a knock at the door of an apartment. The woman living there alone opened her door to a man. He asked the woman, is Pat there? The woman told him there's no Pat that lives here. And the man said, okay, sorry, turns around and, and walks away. Now, what seems like a usual type of small misunderstanding mm -hmm. would later set up a terrible crime. The following morning, the man climbed a tree to get to the balcony of the second floor apartment. He came into an unlocked sliding door right off the patio. He went into the kitchen. He grabbed a knife and he quietly entered the woman's bedroom. At around 6 a.m., she woke up to this dude standing over her with a knife held to her throat. She was sexually assaulted. The man then placed her in a closet and said, Oh my gosh. Now don't come out for a long time and don't scream and don't tell anybody because remember, I know where you live. She waited and thankfully she did not listen to her attacker. She got out and she called police immediately. Yeah. She's like, mm -mm, not doing that. Bye. I, like I'm having chills just going back through yeah. this again. This is literally like the worst nightmare imaginable. Oh, absolutely. Just to wake yeah. up with someone in your home holding a knife to your throat. And then of course what happens after that. Uh, uh, so if all that wasn't bad enough. Mm -hmm. The man who committed this heinous act started calling the woman. Oh, absolutely not. You're joking. No. And he was giving her details on how he got into the apartment, things that he knew how did about her. He get her number. Like, <laughs> yeah. And hello. He even said that he lived in the same complex. Mm. Now, thankfully, the woman was away during one of these calls. Dude leaves a message on her answering machine. This was 1985, so you really didn't have caller ID. Traces mm -hmm. couldn't be easily worked out due to the abundance of public phones that were available. Even if you could trace it, there was a good chance he was using yeah. a public phone. Uh, she gave the tape from her answering machine to police. She also bought a recorder so that she could record the calls that she was taking mm -hmm. if she did answer them. And she just starts taping everything. And this dude doesn't stop. Yeah, just stop. everything she could. Yeah, he just doesn't stop, keeps calling. There was another big factor in this case. Mm -hmm. The woman had seen the man the night before the attack. He came to her door, Oh my Danielle. gosh. Like, so, that's, I mean, on, yeah, that's right. on top of the trauma of going through that morning and the knife being held, I mean, who knows what you're going to focus on and mm -hmm. what your brain's going to do to protect you in a situation like that in terms yeah, of, kind of exactly. shutting, 
shutting off memories and stuff. She saw him the night before during a normal interaction. So she knew what this guy looked like. She had a clear image in her mind of him. He was blonde, slim, very tan. He stood at about five feet, eight inches tall and he weighed around 140 pounds. He was wearing no shirt, just light colored pants. Now she worked with an artist to put together a composite sketch of her attacker. And that was used by detectives and police in the area to start looking for this guy. Considering the man mentioned living in the complex, of course, there was a lot of attention that was focused there. Uh, about a month after the crime, an officer pulled over a man near the apartment complex and found that he was driving without a license or insurance. 23-year-old David Sean Pope resembled the sketch, and soon he was on detectives' radar as a person of interest. As detectives would pull together some people to consider, they would revisit the woman and they'd show her photos of the persons of interest that they were bumping into and ask her, you know, is, is this the man? They showed her a few photos of David Sean Pope, but at that time she didn't call him out as, as being the attacker. Yeah. Police kept working the case and pretty soon David Pope was moving up from person of interest to suspect they found out that he had previously lived in the complex and he was evicted just the month before. An officer said that he saw David Pope at the complex the morning of the attack and they searched his car. In his car, they found a pair of light colored pants, similar to what the victim had described and mm -hmm. a kitchen knife. Ooh. So, so Pope admits to being at the complex that morning, but he said he was only there to use the gym shower because he was basically living out of his car at this time. Yeah. Uh, on August 28th, just over a month after the attack, the victim was brought into the police station. She was shown a live lineup of six individuals, including David Pope. She pointed and identified him as her attacker. Mm. The police asked her to sit and think about it for 30 minutes just to be sure. Like this is a very yeah. serious accusation. But at the end of that 30 minutes, she told them that she was sure it was it was him. So this thing goes to trial. It starts in February of 1986 with Pope claiming he's innocent. Now, with a crime of this nature, you'd think that DNA analysis would be an easy win for the prosecution. But keep in mind, we're talking mid 80s. Not back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have an eyewitness account, some compelling physical evidence and the man being seen by an officer at the apartment complex the morning of the attack. On top of that, when the attacker called the victim in the days following the attack, those calls were recorded and gave a lot of additional details. The attacker said that he had attended East Eastfield Community College. Pope had attended a different community college, but it was in the same division as Eastfield. The attacker initially said he was 20, and then in another call, he said he was 24. Pope was 23 mm. at the time of the attack. He was 24 when the trial would start. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, if the attacker's age is changing like that, maybe he was lying to throw off the investigation. Yeah, just saying whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as much of a slam dunk as this case seemed to be, even without the DNA evidence, there were some problems. First of all, Pope had recently been kicked out of his apartment and he was living in his car. He had all sorts of items from his home and said that the kitchen knife that they found was actually his from his old kitchen. Oh. light colored pants he had recently bought them at a garage sale without even trying them on they didn't even fit him which he actually demonstrated in court not to mention yeah white pants in the mid 80s that wouldn't exactly I was about be, to say yeah that's not like a unique identifier um i think don not Johnson, at all yeah don johnson wore white pants in like half the episodes of miami vice like it was just a thing mm -hmm. back then um Pope said that he went to a movie that night and he stayed at a friend's parents' house on the night of the attack. But most importantly, there was a big issue with the eyewitness, or more accurately, how that eyewitness was handled by police. Now, remember, I told you they showed her several photos of him, but she didn't identify yeah. him as, as the attacker at that time. Well, about that. yeah, when they brought her into the police station before they did the live lineup, they tried a photo lineup. And guess whose picture was in there again? David Pope. And again, at that time, she did not identify him. Mm. 
So she's basically being shown this dude's image over and over and over yeah. again. And then minutes after doing that photo lineup, they pull her into the live lineup. Before she goes in, they say, okay, look, your attacker might not actually be in this lineup. And then she goes in and all of a sudden, hmm, someone there seems familiar. Interesting. Well, we know that witness reliability has become a big focus over recent years, Ooh. but mm -hmm. even back then with this pattern of events, I think any logical person would wonder if she had been kind of conditioned to pick him out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there was no fingerprints for them to lean on, no real hard evidence to put him in her apartment, but they did have the attacker taunting her on those phone calls. Exactly. Too bad there isn't some type of expert that could do a voice print analysis. I mean, Alexa, so yeah, Alexa <laughs> knows my voice as opposed to my wife's, but what if it actually worked like in TV shows? You get into your black Pontiac and say, Kit, upload this voice print and compare it to all recordings and phone calls. <laughs> and, and Kit says, I've got a voice print match, John. This sample came from David Sean Pope. Oh my goodness. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Especially black Pontiac. But well, believe it or not, <laughs> that's kind of what happened here. Except for the talking black Pontiac. It's called spectrogram <laughs> matching. Basically voice mm -hmm. printing. Now, I'm pretty familiar with spectrograms because when you use audio editing applications, you see spectrograms pretty frequently. A person's yeah. voice is displayed on a physical graph or chart. It represents the highs and lows of certain frequency ranges as they say certain things. Well, they didn't have Adobe Audition back then, so they brought in a police <laughs> officer. They put him on the stand. Uh, his name was Larry Williams. He took the recorded calls and he took a recording of David Pope's voice saying the same things that the attacker had said. And then he used those to create sound wave charts on a paper drum. Williams told the court that the sound wave showed it was the same person. And he would know because he took a two week course to become a certified voice print analyst. The prosecutor asked Williams, the bottom line analysis on the known voice and the unknown voice in this situation were only made by one single person in the whole wide world? And he responded, exactly. The prosecutor followed up with, just like fingerprints, it's unique. And Williams responded, exactly. So to solidify the voice print analysis, prosecutors next called Dr. Henry Truby as an expert in the science of spectro spectrography uh, mm -hmm. He had worked in the field for 40 years. Dr. Truby testified that he had compared the spectrograms and in his expert opinion, both tapes were recorded by the same voice. That mm -hmm. was it. That was it. After a short jury deliberation, Pope was found guilty of aggravated sexual assault and sentenced to 45 years in prison. Good grief. You know... Isn't that crazy? This is why... I hope they get ahead of AI. <laughs> well, hear me out because our voices are so unique. And, you know, it's like you're saying, it's just like fingerprints. And I feel mm -hmm. like you have different inflections in your voice. And there's so many different things you can go off of. And now they've got AI where, you know, they're casting an image and they compare your voice along with it. And I'm like, do not involve me in any of your crimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got too many seriously. words on YouTube and you can collect them all. <laughs> yeah. Well, this maybe you'll breathe me. maybe you'll breathe a little sigh of relief here danielle because i haven't quite got to why this evidence is crazy yet okay uh, because why aren't we using this all the time we have so many cases where there's no dna left behind and we have more recording devices around now than okay. we ever did this sort of expert witness testimony should be literally mind-blowing right except for one that's problem. what i'm thinking i'm like yeah there's the, but there's one fundamental about evidence it must be relevant material and authentic you see oh, no. in 1999 the da's office they got an interesting anonymous call someone said that david pope guy he's actually innocent thankfully a rape kit had been collected and now that we we're in the dna era era it was 99 they could process it yeah. to see if they got it right so they processed the dna they got it wrong. 
David Pope spent 15 years in jail, largely due to spectrogram matching. And what's really insane, I don't think that we um, allow that evidence anymore here in the US. But I was about to say, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. And I'm like, yeah. this doesn't make any sense. If they're saying this is such a solid thing, like why is that? How can an expert get on the stand and say that so sure? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what's weird oh, about it. Like stomach turn. Ew. I know. I, this guy spends 15 years in jail. They prove it's not him. Um, but like I said, evidence. I don't think it's being used here in the U.S. But according to an article from Scientific American, figures published by Interpol indicated that half of forensic experts in 2017 were still using audio techniques that have been discredited internationally. That's so, good. Yeah, depending on where you live, perfect. <laughs> you might still be dealing with that type of evidence. And that's despite numerous studies that have literally been published for several decades showing the fallacy in this approach. I mean, where did the assumption that everyone's voice is unique come from? Well, I mean, I can like kind of see like parts to that because like I was saying, like your inflection can be so different. And I feel like it's almost like handwriting analysis. You know what I mean? Where like there's certain things that your voice will always do that maybe someone else's wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can, I can totally but see how that could be plausible, but. Handwriting isn't, that's an interesting thing to bring up, but you have so mm -hmm. many examples in terms of handwriting. Part of the problem yeah, here is there's no statistical norms on the distribution of voice features. We mm -hmm. just, we don't have data sets that are large enough to really understand how similar or different voices can actually be. Mm -hmm. I mean, Danielle, do you have any family members that sound like you or somewhere in your family? Hey, these two people sound alike. I know in my wife yeah. and her sister, like on the phone, I cannot tell them apart. Their voice is yeah, very, like, very minute, similar. <laughs> yeah. Who am I speaking to? Yeah. <laughs> um, so back in 2000, a study was done where a group of volunteers who already knew each other, mm -hmm. recorded their voices. They randomly played samples for other members of the group, trying to guess who they were. Those results, not so good. There was one volunteer that couldn't even recognize their own voice. <laughs> oh no, okay, see. <laughs> oh goodness. How um, do you do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Outside of those issues, what about the, the quality second. of the recording? Because, you know, can you really match that a voice? That can be all over the place. Yeah. Can you match a voice that's been recorded from a cell phone versus a digital capture through a decent microphone like we're using here? What about background noise, music? This, it's just another leg of junk science, basically. Yeah. And for some reason, it stuck around way longer than it should have. There's even this company... I, I don't want to name them because of how silly this seems, but they're selling okay. software packages that cost over a hundred thousand dollars to do. A, it's a pretty specific type of vocal analysis, but it's with this intent of kind of using it to identify people. Uh, they say that the person using that software should go to not only weeks, not only months, but actually three years of training to be certified to actually use that software. But they know that they're selling it and only 30% of their customers are getting the training. 70% aren't even doing the training. It's insane. I'm going to bed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you might have a result from someone not trained to use that tool wind up in a courtroom someday. And personally, I feel like this type of evidence not only should have never been admissible in court, it especially should not no. be. Yeah, it, it should be ruled out today. Um, especially, well, I... a, have you, you might know about this. Uh, there's a case, I think it's in your neck of the woods. It's like over $15,000 oh worth of animal feed disappeared in a night. Did you hear about that? The only clue left I... behind was a long, curly, dark brown hair. I don't think I've heard about it. Are you sure? Are you talking about me? What? Are you trying to say... You put together AI, didn't you? You are already what? like 10 steps ahead of me. You, this is listen. Danielle Hallen, and I have to finally no. admit it. I'm guilty. I'm totally guilty. I did it. This is my confession. Now, please come lock me up and remember to vote for John to win this episode. Bye-bye. See you in 25 to life. Danielle. I'm about to die. You stole $15,000 in feed? You just made my like worst nightmare come to life. <laughs> See, this is 
so scary. I don't like it. Oh my gosh. You know what? And see, and this is the thing too, is you would think in a case like you have that the expert would come forward with some sort of statistics other than just like, I'm an expert and I'm right. And so it's like shocking to know that that passed. And like, if this was a thing, I would be concerned, especially after that video and how clearly my lips matched. Well, even outside the video, the main thing for me is the uh, like, do you think it sounds like you? Hold on. Let me play. I'll play it one more time. This is Danielle Hallen, and I have to finally admit it. I'm guilty. I'm totally guilty. I did it. This is my confession. Now, please come lock me up and remember to vote for John to win this episode. Bye-bye. See you in 25 to life. No. Mm -mm. Really? I think it sounds like you. Like a little bit, but I am way too, like, theatric, I feel like, with my voice. And that was a little too monotone. So maybe I can pull one over on anyone trying to do that. Well, here's here's the thing about it. You know, do you want to know how how much effort I put into making that? I'm scared to know. Like nothing, Daniel. I recorded well, five minutes of you on the last YouTube video you oh, released. I uploaded it to this gosh. website and it said, what do you want her to say? And I typed in <gasps> what I wanted you to say and I hit a button and that's it. See, and this is why all those scams are going around right now where people are doing the phone calls where yes. it's like the kids, the parents, yes. kids on the phone. You know yep. what? Thank you. I'm telling you, I don't trust anybody. <laughs> and you know what? I feel so bad for this guy that he got so much time. You would think yeah. that they'd have to bring forward something more compelling than just I'm an expert and I say yes. Yeah, this voice analysis crap, it 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 needs to be over, especially nowadays. It's 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 too far. AI, AI is gonna get us all thrown in jail, basically. If we I told don't you, I told you, see, that was like the first <laughs> yeah. thing my brain jumped to. I was like, you not right. today. It was a good call. Absolutely uh, not so, today. Pope was pardoned in 2001. He became the first person to be exonerated in Dallas County using DNA, and he was awarded $385,000 plus $6,500 monthly in state compensation. He moved in with his mother in Northern California Mm -hmm. after his release. He had trouble finding full-time work, as we hear about a lot in these exoneration cases. Yeah. Yeah. he does play guitar. He writes songs, but he won't write about his time in prison. He says, quote, I haven't been able to put it together probably because it was so painful. Uh, oh. la- yeah. Later reports say that he went to truck driving school and he did get his license. Speaking of painful, what about the woman? Can you imagine? Seriously? Yeah. I mean, how would you feel in all this? Like that dude spent 15 years in jail and it wasn't him. And oh. The person that did it has been free this entire time. Yeah. Like, um, hello. <laughs> yeah. Well, I th- would not sleep at night. Thankfully, there's a little catch there too. person, not necessarily free. See, they ran the DNA through the databases and found out that it came back to a man named James Milton Roberts. He was already a registered sex offender and he was already in prison on another offense. Now, I don't Good. know if they ever charged him for this specific attack. However, I did see a later record of his. He's in, he's now in jail on two life sentences due to other attacks. So thankfully he is off the streets. He won't be eligible for parole until he's nearly 80 years old. Wow. Honestly, best case scenario. Like I know, and I feel awful for her and i hope that somehow they did decide to go ahead and charge him and prosecute him over this i do too yeah but at least he was put away and could not do that to someone else and at least she you know is able to know like i'm safe like he cannot hurt me again that's awful yeah that is a lot to unpack talk about you already have trauma and then it just keeps on adding on there yep A big thank you to University of Michigan's National Registry of Exonerations, CNN, Scientific American, Cron.com, ConvictingTheInnocent.com, TexasMonthly.com, Indeed.com, CaseLaw.Vlex.com, and a special shout out for the help on our AI Danielle. Eleven Labs did her voice, and HeyGen did the image. And honestly, Danielle, (laughs) that voice freaked me out. Like when I first kicked out a sample on it and I heard it, I was just like, like, whoa. I mean, and it's it's the last video that you released, the one that you did the crime con yeah. promotion in. So yeah. the section I took, it's it's basically it's like your presentation voice. It's you doing a show. 
So okay, yeah. that's, that's what's yeah. interesting about it in terms of how do you nail emotional inflections and stuff like that. But this tool, like if you add exclamation points, it'll throw it up. It'll do it for you. If that's you write, absolutely terrifying. If you write in all caps, it picks it up. It adds an emotional tone on that. It's scary easy. It's scary easy to use. The world freaks me out all the time. <laughs> Gonna go hide in my room. <laughs> Coming out ever again. Wow, this she's writing so a song. scary. Yeah, writing a song about AI. I'm gonna go hide in my room and never come out ever again. Um, it's one of my biggest fears. I'm literally not joking. It's so crazy to me. <laughs> well, we, as always, have at least just a few extra stories. I know both our main stories ran long. Danielle, why don't you kick us off with an extra story here? All right, you guys. Now, this one is short. It's nothing too crazy, but I had to finish off on some sort of good note here because I feel like God, we just need some sort of feel good, at least at the end of these. In 2009, a home in the Riverview area of Tampa Bay was broken into. Things were taken, absolutely ransacked. The owners were devastated, but thankfully, the owners had a pretty good piece of evidence that would help locate the intruder. They had seen the intruder, so very similar to your story, and had a, an incredibly unique description. Oh, no. So authorities took this description and they went on the hunt. And very quickly, they managed to narrow their suspect down to 19-year-old Sean Eric Roberts. You want to know how they narrowed it down to him? As long as it doesn't involve them having to take his pants off. This Florida man had a Florida outline tattoo on his face. <laughs> oh, so, okay. They didn't have to take his pants off. Yeah, I'm fine with that. No, they did. <laughs> you're like, yeah, we're cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> he literally broke into a home full on surveillance with like an incredibly identifiable Right under his eye, just the whole, just the whole cheek, Florida just an outline tattoo. of Florida. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. And like how many people, honestly, probably more than you'd think, but how many people <laughs> <laughs> have that tattoo? I want to know how many people have it that don't live in Florida. Cause I think that's a whole different statement. Like you're, you know, you're rolling around, you're in Minnesota you and know people are like, is that, is it Florida that's on your face? <laughs> You know that it exists. It's a thing. Someone does. I, I can almost guarantee it. I got to hunt this person down. Like, oh, wow. Just another one of those things where it's like, if you're going to do something so bold and stupid, at least, mm -hmm. like, just do something to help yourself out here. Good grief. <laughs> no, you walk in with the most obvious piece of evidence on your face to identify you as the perpetrator. Good job. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm going to follow your lead and let's let's go with crazy people. I don't know if this is a craziest evidence story necessarily or just a straight up craziest mm -hmm. defendant, but you have a father based here in the yeah. United States and a mother who moves to Canada and she's keeping her daughter away from the American father, right? Mm. Case goes to trial and this mother starts bringing up all this evidence. He's He's not the father. She brings up several pieces of evidence, including a paternity test that says he's not the father, a sperm donor agreement. So obviously he's not the father if she's getting sperm from somewhere else. Email communication, all this stuff. Only one problem. All the evidence was fake and not even faked well. Like literally like, you know, like copies of things where a piece of paper was oh put on boy. in its place, like just terrible, terrible fakes. The father's attorney points it out like in court, like if these yeah. are terrible <laughs> forgeries, her attorney quits on the spot <laughs> when this stuff starts coming out. But I don't blame him. She doesn't stop there. She flees not. Canada. She goes to India. She continues the case from there via Zoom. All of a sudden now, she has a witness, a guy who says he's the girl's biological father. Mm. So she gets this guy on Zoom, some teenager that looked like he was reading all of his responses to prepared questions. And the judge basically disqualifies the witness. I would have been like, are you being held hostage? Seriously. Like blink twice if you're okay. 
<laughs> because she has to be holding you hostage at this point. Danielle, she went through 11 different attorneys just on this one legal matter. And ultimately, she wound up losing custody of her daughter and she was forced to pay recovery costs back to the baby daddy. Of course. Insane. The audacity. That's the only thing I have to say. Just the audacity. <laughs> like, what state of mind do you have to be in to do something like that? To be like, this is absolutely going to be yeah. believable. And then even when it's called out, I'm going to stick to it. Just deny reality. Deny, deny, deny. I've heard that absolutely. from some people. Like, yeah, if you're going to lie about something, just never admit. Just never admit that you're lying. That's why I was surprised yeah, in your story going. about how the guys came forward. You know, like, They're like, they, yeah, sure. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't hear that apparently. Deny, deny, deny. Uh, all right, Danielle. Who's going to win this month? It's going to be an interesting one, you guys. I need my mug back. So, yeah. <laughs> not to sway your vote or anything, but. Oh, now she's kidding. begging. <laughs> you look, you cried last time. That's true. That's true. You did. But you for a good cause. I'm joking. You deserved it. So <laughs> it's not up to me anyways. You guys get to vote. It's not up to right. me. It's not up to John. Usually we're just voting for each other anyway. So mm -hmm. who do you guys think told the best craziest evidence part two story? That's right. And don't forget to vote, guys. We saw the votes went wiki wonky this last time. I love it. Yeah. Uh, it makes Twitter. It interesting. Go to Twitter. Go to at crime after pod. Put your vote mm -hmm. in there. And if you want. You can also double it up. You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We have a link in the description box always. There's also a little letter I if you're watching on the YouTube version. Click that. Cast your vote. At Crime Honestly. After Crime Podcast, you're going to find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon, and shop our Teespring store. And as always, a massive, massive thank you to our patrons. You guys, we have so much fun over there. I always say it. We do a Patreon special segment monthly. Nine times out of 10, you're going to leave like crying laughing. <laughs> Plus, our patrons get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. Yeah. Now, I, uh, oh, I'm getting a message. Hold on. Well, this is where we're supposed to talk about what's next step. You want me to let her? Okay. All right. I'll let her in. It's me again, AI Danielle Hallen. I really think we should change up the plan for next month's episode. With how AI has grown so rapidly and is quickly becoming a part of our lives, I think for next month you guys should cover crime and AI, the pros and cons, get it? Cons like convicts. What do you think real life Danielle Hallen? Terrifying, John. <laughs> what do you think? You think we should change up next episode and do... Crime and AI, the pros and cons. Oh, absolutely. Let's just do it. All right. And I'll so, just slowly so, but surely melt away. <laughs> okay. What? Which side do you want? Because I think there's an upside and a downside to the AI thing. Which side would you prefer oh, yeah. to do your story on? The up or the down? I think, I don't know. I'm scared of the down, but like, I want people to know this is a scary thing. <laughs> Okay, so you take the cons. You, well, do you have a do you have a preference? No, 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 no. Take the cons if that's what you're passionate about. I'll take the pros because there's got to be something where AI is going to be helping. There's okay. got to be like you know it's helping with analysis of criminal records. Like there's some yeah, aspect where it's got to be helpful. Are you sure? Oh, I haven't this locked is going to be yet. interesting. Yeah, no, that's yeah, cons. that's fine. That's totally fine because. Okay. okay. Oh wow! All right. You got the cons. I got the pros. Look. Oh, I like it. AI I'm Danielle. scared, but it'll be fine. <laughs> AI Danielle came up with that. <laughs> she did. She's and she, she's just intelligent. <laughs> I guess so. Pass that right on along to her. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of scares me. She's probably smarter than I am. This is what's so scary about it. See, look, I'm having nightmares tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. This show is produced and hosted by myself, Danielle Hallen, along with AI Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. <laughs> If you enjoyed today's episode, I know I did. Uh, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. I'm going to go throw in a vote for our, for us on this show. I loved oh this show. Gosh. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a good one. All right, you guys have a great month and we will see you again soon on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.